AMD's Ryzen 3 CPUs are in for review, starting with the $130 R3-1300X CPU, a 4-core, four 4-thread four unit at 3.5GHz base and 3.7 boost. The R3-1300X competes most directly with the Intel i3 line, where Intel's own G4560 already strikes hard. This lands the R3-1300X pricing about $20 below nearby i3 CPUs and about $40 to $50 below nearby R5 CPUs. Today, we're looking at the R3-1300X for thermals, power, gaming performance, and some production workloads. Before that, this is brought to you by EVGA's CLC-280 liquid cooler for CPUs, which we previously benchmarked and found to be a high performer given its relative silence to the temperature output. Learn more about this $140 cooler at the link in the description below. And immediately before even getting into numbers, the effects of the R3 CPUs can be felt. The i3-7350K, a CPU that we previously said was good, had great ideas, but had a terrible price when it launched, is now $150. So that's a pretty big change in pricing. It was originally in the 180 territory, at which point you really might as well have bought an i5 when it came out, or later an R5, as we said in our review of the R5s. But now at 150, that's a big difference. And that change is almost certainly because of the pressure felt at the lower end and mid-range markets placed by AMD with the R5s, and now with the R3 CPUs coming out today. So that's immediate and noticeable, and that's an important thing. The 7350K is therefore a somewhat comparable product in terms of price. It's $20 more than the closest R3 CPU, the 1300X, and the 7300 is actually now about the same price as the 7350K on all major US retailers that we've checked, both being around $150, or previously it was $150 and $180 for those two SKUs. The R3-1200 review is the other counterparts to the 1300X we're reviewing today. And we do have a separate review for that one. It will go up probably tomorrow. So subscribe for that if you want to catch that one. Today though, we're focusing entirely on power thermals and gaming performance with some production workloads on the 1300X. That's enough to focus on for one thing, including testing on the stock cooler. So we tested the stock cooler that's shipped with the unit and tested it in stock CPU configuration with a torture workload in Prime and a realistic workload in Blender, and then did the same two workloads for an overclock configuration. We'll get through those results today, as well as some power testing done at the EPS 12 volt cables coming out of the power supply directly rather than using wall meter measurements. So that improves our accuracy greatly to a point where we're plus or minus 2%, basically. So let's get into all that. We'll start with power for the testing methodology for all this stuff. You can check the link in the description below to the article. That covers the testing that we're doing and then has additional benchmarks and charts in the article that won't be in this video just for time purposes and length of the video. We have a bunch more synthetic tests that'll be in there along with some extra thermal and power tests. Looking at power first, under idle Windows 10 conditions, the AMD R3 1300X stock CPU consumes about 3.7 watts with plus or minus 2% error. For comparison, the Intel i3-7350K is showing 4.9 watts or about seven watts when overclocked. Keep in mind that this is the first time we're really adding the EPS 12 volt power readings for CPUs. So that means these charts are sparse. We are well aware of that and are adding things as we go. These will grow with time as always. Moving on to a Blender workload. Blender consumed 42 watts for the stock 1300X with an overclock increase in power consumption to 52 watts. That's about a 24% power consumption increase for what we later find out to be a 4.6% render time reduction. The i3-7350K, meanwhile, consumes about 29.5 watts during this workload, with the overclock growing power consumption to 49.2 watts. The 7350K appears to be less power hungry than the R3-1300X as of now. Moving on to a Firestrike physics test shows us some gaming workloads, placing the 7350K at 22 watts, the 1300X at 38 watts consumption at EPS 12 volt again, with the overclocked 7350K at 39.4 watts when on a 1.35 volt V core. The 1300X pushes to 47 watts when overclocked as well with its 0.1 volt offset. Total War Warhammer is our real gaming workload. The 7350K pulls 23 watts to run this game with the 1300X at 42 watts stock. Overclocking increases their power consumption metrics to 54 watts on the 1300X and 58 watts on the 7350K. With Prime 95 LFFT's version 28.5, we observed a power consumption of 39 watts on the 7350K and 56.6 watts on the R3-1300X, with the overclocked counterparts at 59 and 64 watts respectively. 
We have additional power consumption metrics in the article linked below. Next with thermals, we've completely overhauled our thermal testing procedure for CPUs. This is also brand new. And so this one starts out with just the stock cooler performance, we're expanding this for a feature piece soon and we'll recap all the CPUs with our new testing or at least all the major ones along with the stock cooler testing for each of those. Note that we ran all of our actual testing with the standard X62 that we always use so no thermal throttling occurred. As for the stock cooler, operating temperature landed at 59 Celsius when executing a blender workload with the stock configuration and max fan speed. That's definitely getting up there but not deadly yet. Prime 95 29.2 with 8K sizes burned at 74C, which is rapidly approaching the 85C shutdown threshold that we encountered when running the stock cooler with our overclock. So the stock cooler could not sustain our overclocks at all. It would just thermal crash eventually from a shutdown temperature of around 85 Celsius, depending on what we were doing and how quickly the thing heated up. This also produced some interesting power leakage numbers, and you can look at the stock non-overclocked temperature is best for that because the overclocked one just didn't survive long enough to really show any power leakage uh, other than just a runaway and eventual shutdown scenario but this shows the overtime plot of power consumption as we draw more power from higher thermals and just leakage overall with the stock configuration 1300x and the stock cooler before getting into gaming performance, let's take a look at Blender animation render times and Premiere encode times. With our in-house Blender test scene, the AMD Ryzen R3 1300X stock CPU with no overclock completes the render in 89.2 minutes. The CPU is ranked just ahead of AMD's once flagship FX8370, and that's stock, and just behind Intel's Nehalem i7-930 CPU, or about 8.6% behind the i5-2500K overclocked to 4.5 GHz. Similarly, and just for historical context, really, the R3 CPU, the 1300X, is behind the Phenom 2 X6 CPUs overclocked, which sit around 81 minutes. Compared more reasonably to the recent generation products, the R3 1300X CPU completes its render about two minutes faster than the stock i3 7350K for a time reduction of 2.3%. Overclocking the R3 1300X results in a render time reduction of 4.6% from stock R3 setup, or 6.8% from the stock 7350K. Overclocking the 7350K to 5 GHz boosts its speed to about 78.3 minutes, reducing render time by 12.2% from the overclocked 1300X. Using an R5 CPU would net a significant boost, as shown here, we'll highlight a couple of them. If CPU rendering on a budget is in your use cases, you should really consider stepping up to an R5 series CPU. They make a whole lot more sense for this type of task, and they're good performers overall. The extra $40 for a low-end unit would be worth it in this case, but ideally if you can stretch to a bit higher skew, then it might be worthwhile for a budget rendering machine as the R3 ultimately suffers from only having four threads available. That said, if you use CUDA for everything anyway, then it doesn't matter quite as much. Speaking of CUDA, rendering a 1080p 60 ABC HD source video into a video card review with Adobe Premiere takes 156 minutes on the R3 1300X when overclocked to four gigahertz, so that's 2.5 hours to finish the render. The 1500X stock CPU reduces this time requirement by 19%. We didn't bother running the test stock on the 1300X because it just would take far too much time to be worth it. At this point, you really shouldn't be using these products in this manner anyway. Premiere is not as good of a use case for the R3 CPUs as for the R5s previously. And don't be talked into thinking that the R3 will suffice for any meaningful production work in Adobe Premiere either. Rendering can be drastically accelerated by CUDA in some instances, like in our test, but that doesn't help with certain types of effects or some preview playback. Although it is possible to use an R3 CPU for this task, we would strongly recommend purchasing something better suited for video production if that's the desire. The R7 1700 is a good place to look for a more professional outfit where you make some money, or maybe the R5s again, for something where it's more of a hobby. We have additional synthetic and production testing in the article, so you can check the link in the description below for Cinebench, multi-threaded and single-threaded POV Ray, Fire Strike, and Time Spy, and I believe a couple others are down there as well with the power testing that wasn't covered here. Now though, we're gonna move into gaming for the R3 1300X. Starting with Total War Warhammer, first note that items containing asterisks have been rerun with the most recent version of Total Warhammer, which we plotted previously in our Rise and Revisit coverage as improving FPS by several percentage points on both AMD and Intel CPUs. All the relevant units were updated for this review, 
And previously we found that the performance uplift for Ryzen when this game updated derived from the game update itself, which also benefited Intel. So it wasn't just some arbitrary BIOS update or something like that that just magically fixed performance. It was actually developers waking up and using the extra threads and optimizing their game code. The AMD R3-1300X stock CPU performs at an average frame rate of 118 FPS with lows at 71, 1% and 65, 0.1%. The closest current gen neighbor is the i3-7300 stock CPU at 128 FPS average with lows comparably timed. Given that the 7300 and 7350K have both been at $150 for a while now, we can next look to the 7350K stock performance at 134 FPS average. This plants the 7300 and 7350K 8% and 13% ahead of the 1300X stock CPU, respectively. The 7300 is a locked, so that's the end of its performance. Overclocking the 1300X to 4.1 GHz permits the R3 CPU under test today to surpass the 7300 in gaming performance with this title. The 7350K overclocked to 5 GHz boosts to 150 FPS average, leading the 1300X OC by 16% in average FPS, with lows also ahead in the Total War update. Battlefield 1 is next and is also on the list of titles that received an update boosting both Intel and AMD performance following the Ryzen launch. In this game, the 1300X operates an average FPS of 110, which places the R3 CPU ahead of the FX8370 and i7-930 by about 14%. The G4560 leads the R3 1300X stock CPU by about 2%. Battlefield 1 has routinely shown strong performance on these Intel CPUs, so this isn't all that surprising. Overclocking the 1300X bolsters performance to 116 FPS average, and that's a gain of 5.9% over stock performance for those keeping track. This lands the 1300X OC around the 2500K, and for a current gen comparison instead, the 7300 CPU averages 125 FPS for the 14% lead it gains over the stock 1300X and 7.8% lead it gains over the overclocked 1300X. Looking to the 7350K, which received its price drop almost certainly because of Ryzen 3's launch, and so Ryzen 3 is already doing its job, performance leads by 17% at 128 FPS average stock or 17% when both the 7350K and 1300X are overclocked. Watch Dogs 2 has proven to be a heavily multi-threaded game and has benefited from higher core and thread counts in the past, but also cares about the frequency still, as most games do. Here, the R3 1300X CPU operates at 51 FPS average stock, with lows at 41% and 33.5, 0.1%. Overclocking to 4.1 GHz gets us an improvement of 7.3%, now at 54.5 FPS average instead. This plants the i3-6300 right between the R3-1300X stock and overclocked values at 54 FPS average and runs the 1300X stock CPU behind the 7300 lock CPU by 16%. That's pretty comparable to what we've been seeing in the rest of the test so far. Overclocking closes the 7300 lead to 7.9%. The 7350K stock CPU manages 66 FPS average for a lead of 30% stock over the 1300X. And overclocking doesn't do much for the 7350K's performance here as it's already quite high, though we do gain another couple of frames per second. Ashes of the Singularity is mostly treated as a synthetic benchmark in our tests at this point, and so isn't really a game scenario, but still a useful scenario. We mostly use it to understand scaling, particularly with a well-optimized DX12 title. The R3 1300X stock CPU operates at 21 FPS average, placing it between the i3-6300 and FX8370. The i3-7300 CPU operates 5.7% faster, and overclocking the 1300X to 4.1 GHz boosts it beyond the 7300 by 3%. The 7350K stock CPU outperforms the 1300X overclock CPU marginally, though sustains better low-end performance, and overclocking the 7350K boosts it to 16% ahead of the 1300X overclocked, which again remains consistent with previous tests. This is about the same spacing as we've been seeing. For more gaming benchmarks, additional power and thermal tests, and synthetics, be sure to check the full written review that's linked in the description below. Again, this contains a couple of extra game charts. The R3 CPUs are interesting. They're not quite as clear-cut a decision as the R5 CPUs, where we more or less said buy these instead of the i5s going forward unless asterisk some special situation applies. These, though, are interesting primarily because they've already forced Intel to respond with the 7350K price reduction, or at least they contributed to that response. And that's helpful. The 180 price point previously was just untenable. This makes the 7350K a real competitor. It's not too distant in price now, and it's unlocked. Whereas the 7300, priced about the same on Newegg and Amazon for US buyers, is locked and just not as good, period, and same price. So we can kind of forget about that one 
until a point at which the 7350K changes in price or the 7300 drops in price, at which point reevaluate our charts because uh, they have the data for you if you need it. So the 7350K is interesting. AMD's 1300X runs a $130 price target. This makes it $20 cheaper than the 7350K. It is a reasonable performer in games if generally behind the 7350K and the 7300, again, generally speaking. So it manages a decent performance overall, but it's still a little bit behind. In performance and uh, production synthetic type workloads, the 1300X isn't as impressive as the higher-end R5 CPUs where you have more cores and threads, and so they perform better. The 1300X ultimately is a four-core, four-thread part, and if it's competing against other four-core or four-thread parts, even if they're two-core and four-threads, really it's going to be close. It just comes down to frequency at that point and other potential architecture optimizations or software-level optimizations. Because at that point, you don't have the brute force power of something like a 1700 where you've got way more threads and just will clearly dominate in a test that is thread limited. So against the 7350K, something like Blender just doesn't make the 1300X look as good as the Blender test did for previous launches, like the R5 CPUs versus the very thread and core limited i5 CPUs by comparison. That means that for our perspective on this, if you are actually serious about doing something with production other than just brandishing the results to say this is what the CPU does, we would recommend that you strongly consider an R5. If you're looking at an R3 and considering using it for Blender, it probably means that you're on a pretty tight budget. If that's the case, if you can manage to shore up another $40 or $60 and you're not going to benefit from something like CUDA acceleration that much, then we'd recommend going for an R5, not an i5, an R5 to be clear. If you can't afford that, just look at our benchmarks and all the other ones and try and piece together what makes sense for you. Ultimately, the R3 CPUs pose a real threat to Intel's i3 lineup. The G4560 holds strong at the cheaper price point, but the R3 doesn't challenge in that territory. The i3s, however, have already been weakened by Intel's own G4560 and now by AMD's R3s. The i3-7350K is a superior CPU in nearly all the gaming tests and manages to hold a lead in Blender rendering when overclocked, but not stock. Stock, the 1300X outperforms the 7350K in our Blender test. The next major differentiator is the IGP. If that's of interest, cost can be saved by going with the Intel i3 part if actually using the IGP and not just letting it sit there with a DGPU. This helps hold the line for SI builds where an IGP might be preferred for biz client type systems. So we may see AMD growth in that market sector, which is certainly important. For gaming builds, that's not much of a concern and the R3 1300X can help save $20 by cutting the IGP and then resorting to a DGPU for your gaming performance. As for the stock cooler, it's not terribly loud, so AMD's at least done decently there. Unfortunately, it's also not terribly good. It's, it's actually kind of bad. So if you're doing any kind of overclocking at all, just get rid of this immediately, uh, repurpose it as perhaps a hockey puck, and then get a real cooler, even if it's a $20 cooler, because we were seeing thermal shutdowns with the 1300X when overclocking it to our anywhere really in the 3.9 to 4.1 gigahertz range, even with as low an offset as 0.1 volts with a, with a voltage offset. So if the plan is to overclock and you can gain a decent amount of performance from overclocking, so we would encourage it within normal warranty reason and not blowing things up, then get a better cooler. Otherwise, if you don't plan to overclock, it's not terrible. It'll keep the thing alive. It won't scream like some of the other coolers that Intel has made in the past and AMD to be fair. Uh, but it's not very good. So this is the kind of thing you replace a little bit later, maybe after the thermal compound has turned into thermal concrete anyway, and you need to replace it with a better cooling solution. The R3 CPUs compete well. We still think that AMD's stronghold is in the R5 territory. So the R5 1600 and 1600X are the most interesting to us. We gave the R5 1600X an editor's choice award and highly recommended it over the i5 7600K at its price point. So those still have our interest primarily. Not everyone can afford those, and that's fine. At that point, it makes little sense to buy an i5. You're looking at R3s and i3s. The R3s round out AMD's pack. And now it's basically, are you gaming? Or do you have, I, I don't know. It's even, even outside of the gaming scenarios now, you're looking at four threads versus four threads. So in something like Blender, it just doesn't matter. Just whatever clocks higher and has better optimization is going to win. So it just, it comes down to, does the R3 offer something specifically you want? Maybe there's some sort of 
power reason you'd want it. Or maybe you have platform reasons. If you want AM4 rather than an Intel platform, there's a potential argument that you have a wider length for upgrade pathways by going AM4. So if the plan is to buy a low-end CPU like an i3 or an R3, and you're looking to the distant future, then potentially the AM4 platform will get you further with the next Zen launch. Because if you're trying to stick with the same platform, same everything, same OS, it'll be a lot easier to drop in a CPU. That's a valid reason to go R3 instead of I3 at this point, even though the I3 is pushing better performance in gaming workloads and things like that. So that's an item to think about. Upgrade pathways, saving a couple bucks, $20 cheaper, uh, and potentially ending up with a cooler that's not terrible unless you're overclocking, so that could save you some money as well. But that's all for this one. As always, check the article below for more information. There's a lot more in there, especially on the power side. And subscribe for more. The R3 1200 review is next and will be on our channel as soon as we can get it done. As always, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Gamersnexus.squarespace.com to pick up a shirt like this one. This is the GN Graph logo. I'll see you all next time. The i3s, however, have been weekend. Mm, weekend. Weekend. I3s are having a weekend.